Hey everybody, thank you so much for being here and tuning in this weekend. My name is JJ Matai and I'm one of the worship pastors here at Jubilee Fellowship Church. I get the honor and the privilege of welcoming you to our online service here right now. If you're new here and you've never been here before or you're new, a couple of services watching, we would love to connect with you. We're not coming after you, we're not coming to your house. We just want to know you and connect with you to get you more connected to what's going on at our church. If you go to jfc.org new, we have a quick card you could fill out and you even get a gift in the mail sent to you just for doing that. What could be better than that? If you're part of this community at all in any way, we would love for you to be a part of our commenting during the service. It's a way for you to stay connected with other people watching online since you're not in the building, but certainly a part of the whole of the community. Finally, in every way and everything that's happening in our church, we just wanna draw everybody together in whatever way connects you. We have three easy ways that you could give to be a part of the bigger kingdom vision that our church has to share Jesus with people. So however you come here, however you want to be a part of it, we would love for you to connect with us, and I will see you at the end of the service. So many good-looking people. And then the rest of us. <laughs> I'll let you decide which one you are. Great to have you here. Um, I want to mention, begin this with prayer, and the end with prayer in the sense of the importance of it. We have a group that meets before the service uh, on Saturdays at 3 and really... God really spoke into this service through that. So be aware of that. Prayer is important. I appreciate many of you I've reached out to and asked you to pray. It's a very hot topics. It's really a wild thing we're going to be dealing with. And many of you prayed. I thank Pastor John, his word of encouragement and prayer. I thank my sweet Nancy for her prayer. She texted me an amazing prayer right before service, uh, spoke to my heart. Now, so uh, we are in this series called Hot Topics. And tonight's kind of an introduction, but a broader take on it. I do want to update you on Pastor John. He had surgery uh, for uh, kidney stones on Wednesday. He's steadily improving. And so continue to uh, pray for him and his speedy recovery. As Jake mentioned, he will be back in uh, to speak this coming next weekend. And uh, what part of our hot topics is about Israel, anti-Semitism, what's going on there. And it's a serious issue. Uh, that has risen in our nation and around the world. You'll want to hear his message on that. So uh, how many have heard the word cancel culture? Yes. Okay, we're going to kind of set that as a baseline. All right. And I have worked very hard at this message not being my opinion. And I have eliminated a lot of that. So I'm going to be very careful with that. All right. But our cancel culture takes all of these hot topics that we've talked about or we've heard about, things like the woke, the gender issues, Antifa, Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ, identity issues, abortion, anti-Semitism, Israel. I'm not covering all of those at all. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? Hey, let's jump into this one, all right? Uh, we won't be able to cover all of them. We'll probably come back and do this series again. But each of the messages are going to address one of these issues and the importance to us as followers of Jesus Christ. I was thinking about this earlier. Uh, if you're a student of all of sociology or Christian nature, uh, you have extremes in these cultural issues that we're facing. On one hand, on a far end, you've got those that believe in, in more of an Old Testament theology about we're going to take this by our power, by our force, and they incorporate basic Old Testament scriptures, and they believe in violence. That's a far end. The other end is kind of along the line of a monk or a monastery. All right. I lean more toward the monk just because I got the hair for it. All right. That's about it. But anyway, have you ever just wanted to escape this world? Just get away from all this stuff. But on the other hand, have you ever been angry and frustrated and want to do something? Honestly, I think most of us are somewhere in between on that. So why did I pick cancel culture? It's how each of these groups that we've mentioned use media, mainstream media, social media, use boycotts and various means to cancel out someone else's idea or opinion. So how do we react to a blatant attack on our faith and morality? So I want you to remember these three words. Say Bible, Bible. Jesus, Jesus. Everybody knows Jesus is the right answer. And Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Be believe it or not, I'm going to give you in those three words a template that will help you address what goes on in our world. 
All right? Cancel culture, they want to shame you into their beliefs. Cancel culture wants to attack you for biblical truth. Cancel culture wants to bully you into shutting up. Now, the Bible talks about, in general, two groups of people, okay? Speaks of God's people. In the Old Testament, it was Israel. In the New Testament, it's the church. Then the Bible speaks about the world, all right? The church, which those of us that are here gathered, are those that claim to know Christ, and we want to pursue heavenly kingdom on earth. Are you for that? Okay. Let me give you this. Jesus prayed before crucifixion. It was a high priestly prayer. He prayed for us. He says this in John 17. I have given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. It's pretty interesting. Now, a little story here. It was the end of a long day. Uh, Maybe you've got kids, you're tired, you're hungry, you go to the restaurant. My wife and the kids, we settled in uh, to the booth. We looked over the menu, ordered our food. And if you've had kids, you're going to relate to this. Uh, It just escalates. One bumps the other. One steals a a French fry from the other. They start talking and pushing. And and in a matter of seconds, the Coke is spilled on the table. (laughs) So as a dad, I knew what I had to do. Jumped out of the booth. I dragged them outside. I'm old school. I gave each of the boys a quick and controlled swap to the seat of learning. I gave them a stern lecture, and then I told them that their behavior was acceptable and it will not happen again. So the fighting stopped. We went back to the restaurant. I figured I was pretty proud. I'm a good dad. I've done my duty. That is until the cops arrived. They pulled me aside. They questioned me, and then they placed me under arrest. You see, the kids weren't mine. They were seated in the next booth. So apparently you're not allowed to discipline someone else's kids. You ever want to do that? Now there's a point to that story. It illustrates this. Folks, tough love, discipline starts at home. Do you believe that? A father disciplines his own kids, not someone else's. It's the same in a spiritual realm. God's discipline always begins with those he calls his own. It is true of Israel in the Old Testament, and it's true of Christians today. Now, I get angry at those who are mocking God, denying him, challenging him, those who defend their blatant sin, and those who attack anyone who stands up and proclaims a Christian viewpoint. Some of you are here today and you feel the same. But here's the thing. It's very important. We assume God's judgment should begin with those who do the greatest evil. But folks, it does not. It starts with us. And honestly, to tell you the truth, that is frustrating to me. And it's been frustrating to God's people throughout the ages. You ever want to just call down fire like one of the Old Testament prophets? Wouldn't that be a great spiritual gift? If you're married, you don't want that gift. (laughs) Trust me. (laughs) You've been mad at your spouse, I know. Come on, folks, be real here. So I want to spend a moment in this message to speak to those here that claim to walk a Christian faith. Here's what Galatians says. Listen, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Galatia. It isn't written to the world. Underline that. Understand that. Here's what he's saying to the church. They were wrestling with issues of the law, of the flesh. And Paul writes and explains what we as believers should not be wrestling with. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. It says this. Speaking to the church, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, 
impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery. Who's he talking to here? Okay, just making sure you're tracking. Hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger. And man, wasn't that a great healing last week as pastor preached on anger and the Lord moved in each of those services in an amazing way. Thank God for that. That's what we want to experience. Selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. That could be a normal day for some of you. Before we, as believers, in our cancel culture, cast the first stone, I have to ask you with great sincerity, what sin are you allowing in your life? I'm, I'm, I'm the fuzzy, warm, fuzzy preacher. I, I, I like warm, fuzzy messages. I struggle with this because I have to get in your face as someone who loves you and cares for you and tells you that what God wants for you is his best. The following of that Galatians there is a fruit of the spirit that should be manifest in your life. But folks, if we spend all of our time living in the flesh, and I have seen it over the years as a pastor in churches over the years, people who are so filled with the flesh, but they are the biggest on the corner, on the blogs, on the Facebook preachers of this sinful world. It is not the way we should live our life. Let's start dealing with our stuff at home. Yeah, that's good. Folks, what about your morality? Is it easy to open up the TV to things that probably you shouldn't be watching? Is it easy to get in relationships and live in a life that you shouldn't be living? Is it easy, all right, in those areas to just give in to the world's ways of thinking? What about this? What about our hostility? What about our quarreling and outburst of anger? What about dissension and division? Boy, I've seen some church splits over stupid stuff. So I want to say this. Before you be looking at the culture out there, let's start at home and look at this. Before you form an opinion and broadcast that, I want to ask you this. What does God say? What does God say? Now, I'm going to get into something that's very, okay, I'm just going to get into it. <laughs> Do you know the truth is that in, across most Christian churches, at least in America today, very few people have a full biblical knowledge. We were teaching foundations. We we're in the old building. We, we have one session on the Bible. Uh, it's going to come up this fall. If you really want to get into some good stuff, sign up for foundations. But we were talking that day about the Bible, and there's two things we do. I give a quiz. There's 25 questions, basic questions. Let me ask you, who was the first man? All right, you got one right. Way to go. Way ahead of some folks. I gave them to all the pastors, too. You want to know what they did, didn't you? They did good. They did good. I'm sitting at a table. We're talking about the Bible. A guy that's been at JFC for a while said there and said, I have never read the Bible. So, well, where do you get your biblical truth? Well, Pastor John. Good biblical truth, no doubt. Great preacher. Great truth. Great revelation. Amazing. But folks... If that Bible is not being looked at and read, and here's where we go. Let me just tell you, that way out group over there that's wanting to take over the world with violence and force, they'll put something out of the Old Testament and they'll live on that as the word from God. But if you don't look at the whole of the Bible and see from the beginning to end what God is saying and doing, you will be making religious choices that are not of God. I'm telling you, please make a priority to understand the Bible. There's so many great apps. There's so many ways to do that. Please don't miss that. Don's here. We do Bible devotions every day, some pretty good stuff. We have a lot of comments back and forth and thoughts and what is God saying. Some of you would do well to be a part of a group like that, to know what the word is God. So let me just say this. 
Is there stuff in your life? Is there morality issues? Is there thought issues that God wants to deal with? So now the fun part, okay? Now that you are all very uncomfortable and quiet, we're going to move into the one that you came to hear tonight. How do we see the world? Let me tell you what the Bible says. We don't fight flesh and blood. Isn't that hard to grab a hold of? Because you put somebody on Facebook, whatever it is, Facebook. I got hacked. Some of you know that. I got a guy who's impersonating me selling crypto. Folks, the only bit of coin I have is in a jar. I have no idea what crypto is. I don't care to know what crypto is. Cash is king in my house. Amen. Credit card is my wife's queen. We get along real well. But we have made the enemy out of the world. God did not. We've got to look at who really the enemy is. Here's what the Bible says. We are not fighting against the flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Okay, so let me just say this. A few points here. I don't minimize the fact that the world has an agenda. The world has an agenda. They are not God's people. I'll show you in scripture in a minute. Two, they serve the Lord of this unseen world. Whether it is intentional or unknown, they serve the Lord of this world. Three, the agenda is against God and any who love, serve, and have been redeemed by Jesus. If today you have experienced the love and forgiveness and grace of God and you've received that, you have been redeemed from this world and you have a place in eternity with God. For it's been that way since the deception in the garden and rebellion. We're not fighting people. We want to. It's easier. There's a face there. Okay? We have a society today that's become increasingly more like the one Isaiah saw in Jerusalem 2,700 years ago. Here's what he says in Isaiah 5.20. Where people call evil good and good evil. Can you relate to that? Yes. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. This thing we're dealing with is not a new thing. The medium of broadcasting is very effective and very powerful. But this is not a new thing. So you can look at history. You can look at the cultures throughout the Bible. And many and most of them were against God. You look at the story of Israel. You read about the prophets. You read what they have written. Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, the minor prophets. And you see all across time, this culture, all right, in some form is a cancer, cancer <laughs> yeah, cancer culture, good. I think that's a slip of the tongue that made sense. <laughs> this is not new. We have experienced in our country a couple hundred years of a great freedom in, in, in spiritual things. We have men and women that formatted that for us, but that is changing. And I know it's hard. I want to hold on to that, but it is changing. So what are we going to do in this culture that is going to be biblical and effective? Here's what Jesus said. All those in the synagogue, it talks about when he went and spoke. In Luke, it says, we're filled with wrath. All right, and if you go to Israel, some of you are fixing to go here, what, a couple weeks? All right, how many have been to Israel? Raise your hand. Okay, many of you. Uh, I know Pastor John says it, but I'm telling you, you got to go. We go up to this mountain where this verse is believed to happen, and it said this All of these people were filled with wrath, rose up, and thrust him out of the city. And they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him over the cliff. That's a pretty big cancel culture right there, I'm telling you. It's not new. Jesus faced this time and time again. The early church, the Apostle Paul, they faced hostile pagan cultures. It's interesting because with the Jewish law, 
the religious people that hated Jesus, and then you had the Roman culture that had their own beliefs. This is where the New Testament church was built, in an anti-culture because of Rome and certain religious laws. The early church and the Apostle Paul, here's what it says in Acts. Read through the book of Acts. said, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. All but one of the apostles were martyrs. Yes. I'm, not, I'm not raising my hand for that. No. I'm not voting for that. Okay? But please understand the point. This isn't a new thing. It's new to us. So from the Bible and the life of Jesus, I want to create that, not as my opinion, but that as the guide. How do we respond? Jesus didn't fight culture. Jesus transformed culture. I, I hope you hear me. You can, you can do everything out there to fight that, and it's just not going to be effective. I, I know people in our church that, man, they are at war with somebody from one of these groups. You're not going to win that. It's not going to be effective. Because Jesus didn't do that. Right. And the Bible doesn't teach that. And I know I'm going to get some certain responses from people. Let me give you this statement. I read this. This isn't original to me, but I love this. Jesus didn't eat with prostitutes, sinners, and tax collectors because he wanted to appear inclusive, tolerant, and accepting. He ate with them to call them to repentance. Yes. Yeah. That's right. That's good. Jesus cared about freedom. Jesus cared about redemption. Jesus cared about healing lives that were lost and broken. Can I tell you that same Jesus cares the same today? Yes. Do we care about the things that Jesus cares? So I've got six things here. They're similar in ways, but they're different. Number one, this is a template that you can use. These notes are, are online if you want to come back and look at these. Number one, Christians should not be surprised when their beliefs are the object of criticism or outrage. I grew up late 60s, early 70s, and all of a sudden there was a shift in how the world, at least the world we were in, saw Christians. It was subtle. We became kind of the butt of jokes on TV shows. We became all oh, those goofy Christian people. And it just escalated over time where the Christians were seen in a certain light. Let me tell you this. According to recent research, only 6% of the Americans hold a biblical worldview. That means most Americans do not think in the biblical sense issues as marriage Human sexuality from a perspective influenced by the Bible. Comes back to what I said earlier. You can go after somebody with your religion, but if you don't understand the Bible, you're not going to accomplish what God wants to do. Number two, Christians should expect to face opposition for holding views in line with the Bible. Now let me go there. You'll see this, you've heard this. As a believer, we're accused of being hateful. For believing and teaching what the Bible says about many things. You can talk about creation. You can talk about only two genders. You can talk about the sanctity of all human life. You can talk about sexual immorality. Just to name a few. And you're going to be considered hateful. Now, if you're a hateful person, there's a difference. Do you understand that? The entirety of God's word has never been popular with the majority of humanity. Back to before Jesus prayed in John 17, he's having a conversation with his followers. And he says this. Before he was betrayed, Jesus said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. I want to be identified for the right team. I want to be hated for the right reasons. If I stand on the Bible and I'm hated, it's not a surprise. The Apostle Paul then writes, all who desire to live a godly life 
in Christ Jesus. How many want to do that? Just raise your hand. All those who desire all, John does this. How many is all? All. That's in Hebrew and Greek. (laughs) All. Who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Three, Christians should expect to face opposition. Now, this is important. Jumping back to my first point about the church. Christians should expect to face opposition for a hypocritical lifestyle. Anybody here perfect? Got a couple. Got a couple. Good. I'm so glad. We need perfect people in this church because a lot of us are not very perfect. And can I tell you, we, we sin. We fail God. In that Galatians list, there's things in there that I have failed at. But when you consistently evolve into a lifestyle of sinfulness, disregarding conviction and the Holy Spirit, trying to free you of that, then that's where we can get into trouble. You need to rightly examine and regularly examine your lives against the scripture. Make sure the reason you're being opposed to is due to godly not sinful behavior. Number four, Christians' highest pursuit is love and not law. There is an element in the church today that is all about this law. Law is important. Do not get me wrong. But the Lord has come to give us freedom from that law by the work of the Holy Spirit. Those rules, I get it. But you know what? When God is running it here, Not an issue. Some of you don't understand what that is. Jesus taught, if you love those, let me just tell you, Jesus taught, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. Can I be honest? Some of this stuff out there, I just really just really want to go after some people. But this says that I can't do that. And I have to be honest with my heart and say, God, help me to love like you loved. Again, the same idea in Matthew 5. I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. What does that look like? Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Man, I'd like to rewrite that verse. (laughs) I say to you, kick your enemies' butts. I'll stop there. I will get into trouble. Five, Christians must know truth and grace. And that's a hard balance at times. Here's a great story. Paul, uh, it's in Ephesus, okay? It's a really amazing thing. You talk about cancel culture. This is amazing. He was in Ephesus, and he's preaching the gospel, and he's talking about their idol, these little idols. And a couple of the people were going to lose revenue, and they got really aggravated about it. And they drummed up this crowd in this hatred. And it says that the whole city was filled with confusion, Boy, that's today, isn't it? And they rushed into the theater with one accord. Most of them, this is funny, most of them did not even know why they had come together. That's kind of freaky, isn't it? Why are we here? I don't know. Somebody's yelling, come on, man. Okay. In a sense, social media can do the same thing. In a sense. So here's where it goes. This is great. All right, they're yelling. All right, for two hours, two hours, they're yelling all with one voice. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Two hours. Two hours later, why are we here again? (laughs) What are we doing? All right, they wanted to kill Paul. Here's what happened. Paul persuaded and turned away many people from idolatry to the true and living God in Ephesus and throughout most of Asia. Okay, there's a difference there. 
I want to be careful because I want to share something because I don't want to reveal specifics. Um, in a local uh, restaurant, I go on a regular basis, and there's a young lady there, probably mid 20s, and many of them know I'm a pastor. I don't hide that. Uh, my Bible kind of gives that away. Yeah. Anyway, um, and so one day, just out of the blue, she said, I want you to know I'm an atheist. Okay, the law in me said, hmm, I got you. Let me tell you what. I know this stuff about atheism. Let me just tell you. And that was my spirit. I was ready to go. I'm not apologetic, but I knew enough. And the Holy Spirit just said, no, shut up. <laughs> Don't go there. I was like, man, straighten out that atheist, man. She needs to know, you know, you know what we think. And I'm serious. I go on there on a regular basis, and it was a whole month. And I'm sitting reading, doing stuff, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you need to talk to her. Yeah, all right, God, I'm ready. No, no, here's what I want you to say. God speaks to us, folks. Yes, he does. And here's what the Lord gave me. I went up to her. I won't tell you her name. I won't tell you what restaurant. I said, hey, can I tell you something? Do you know why I believe in God? And all of a sudden, I said this wall, like, oh, okay. This religious person's going to hammer me. And her, her, her guard was up. I said to her, let's say her name's Sally. I said, Sally, you're one of the most unique, very special, wonderful people I know. And I find it so hard to believe that someone like you came out of nothing. I actually believe that it took God to create you because you are so special. You know what she did? She threw a bagel. No. <laughs> she started crying. She was behind the counter in the middle of the restaurant. She came out, tears in her eyes. She put her arms around me, started to hug her. Now, I could have told her about the atheist stuff, but it wouldn't have the same impact. It's changed our relationship. Love her, pray for her. I want God to let her see the God Almighty that we know. The point is this. The law wasn't what she needed. It was the love that she needed. And she responded to that. And some of it, listen, some of you as parents, maybe you have older kids and you're struggling. Listen, they don't need a message. They just need your love. They need your prayers, and that's valuable. So, 1 Peter says this, Do not fear the threats. Don't be frightened. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. There's a difference in that or the religion you have. Does that make sense? Yes. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against you your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Yes. <sighs> Last, the church must, must put its hope in God. The hope of the church is in Christ Jesus himself. Yes. Please hear my heart. Don't get ticked off. It isn't in a political system. Right. It isn't in a blog it isn't in Facebook. It is in Christ Jesus. Church, we do not need to fear any cancel culture. Because guess what? Christ cannot be canceled. History's most powerful cultures, most powerful leaders have tried but they don't exist anymore. Yeah. But Jesus is still on the throne yeah. and his church is still real and strong. Yes. And folks, it will be forevermore. Amen. So be careful how you deal with that. So let me come back to this. I asked you at the beginning, the Bible. Let me start there. Don't read part of it. Don't quote part of it. Know it all. Because you will get in the problem of taking this bit and making a whole belief system that doesn't fit with the whole Bible. Please hear my heart on that. You've got to know cover to cover what that means. And we call it the scarlet thread. It's been discussed. Pastor John's mentioned it. From the beginning to the end, there is a red thread, a scarlet thread about Jesus all the way through. 
He was there in the beginning. He's there in the end. It is the real deal, but you cannot just take this. That's my struggle with some church doctrine. All right? Can we vary on something? Sure. But when you look at the basic truth of God, you cannot do that outside of the whole Bible. Jesus. If you choose to be aware and addressing any of these issues in our culture, let me just tell you, stop and look at the life of Jesus and his encounters with the culture. Talking to Pastor John and and, and our teaching team, and and Jake, I know he's out right now, probably goofing around, but there he is. (laughs) No, Jake's, I'm teasing Jake. Um, We talked about what, example of Jesus really demonstrate what we're talking about tonight. And I think one of the best, one of the many, but one of the best is the Samaritan woman. She was just, she was just not really, she, she was so discarded that she couldn't come with the other women in the early morning to get water from the well. She was not esteemed in her community. And she would come in the middle in the heat of the day And Jesus broke the rules by talking to a Samaritan woman who begins to talk about living water. And she didn't understand, and they talked a little religious stuff. And finally, Jesus spoke into her life. She had been married five times, and she was living with somebody. And here's as simple as it is, folks. This is what Jesus said. He addressed her sin. He did not condemn her. He addressed it. And he said... Go and sin no more. He didn't argue with her. Didn't battle with her. He let the Holy Spirit lead that conversation. The Bible says she went back to her village and turned it upside down for God. How's that for canceling culture? Amen. Amen. I can give you my opinion. I can tell you what I think about all these things going on, and I have opinion. It's mine. Nancy and I have decided certain things. It's ours. But let me just tell you, you have to start with the Bible, Jesus, and finally let the Holy Spirit lead you. Do not just arbitrarily think, let the Holy Spirit lead you. Hear God when he speaks about this culture that we deal with. Now, I do believe that there are agendas we fight. And in a general sense, here's what I'm going to say. There are ways that we deal with our culture that are agenda-based from corporations and things like that. But on a personal level, engage. Does that make sense? Make your choice there. Now, again, I am not against you having an opinion or taking steps, whatever those look like, The filters, the Bible, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Hey, it's me again. Thank you so much for watching our service and being a part of this. I personally hope, and all of us from Jubilee Fellowship Church, hope that God connected in your life and met you right where you are this weekend in this service. Like I said at the beginning, just because you're watching online does not mean that you're not part of the whole of the community of what our church is doing. And we are so grateful that you're a part of this. So before you go, subscribe to our YouTube channel and we hope to see you next weekend. Have an awesome week.